Okay. Well, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our closing speaker. Well, I'm doing a little something after, but nothing significant. Uh, this is the real deal. This is Mary Roberts. Uh, Mary Roberts is the Robert Sterling Clark Visiting Professor in Art History at Williams College and also Professor of Art History and 19th Century Studies at the University of Sydney in Australia. In 2016, Mary was awarded the Art Association of Australia and New Zealand's Book Prize for her 2015 book from University of California Press, Istanbul Exchanges, Ottomans, Orientalists, and 19th Century Visual Culture. Her expertise is in Orientalist and Ottoman art studies with a particular interest in the history of artistic exchanges and the culture of travel. Her first book on John Frederick Lewis and women's travel writing, Intimate Outsiders, the Harem in Ottoman and Orientalist Art and Travel Literature, was published by Duke in 2007. She has co-edited four other books and has been a Getty Scholar, a CASVA Senior Scholar, a Yale Center for British Art Fellow, and a Clark Oakley Fellow. Her next book is on artists as collectors of Islamic art. Welcome, Mary Roberts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. I can think of no better room of experts to, to have a conversation with about Leighton's Arab Hall, unless, of course, we held a seance and conjured Atchison, Leighton, and De Morgan, and, and Crane. Let me, <laughs> let me not forget Crane. Um, before commencing, I want to express, uh, express a special thanks to Elizabeth Pretjohn, Peter Trippi, and Sarah Turner for the invitation to this very stimulating conversation around a brilliant exhibition, and we've had a great day of papers. My thanks to Ella Fleming for help with the logistics. I also want to thank Daniel Robbins and his colleagues at Leighton House for dialogue about the interior and generously providing access to their archives. Um, and also to Claire Longman the, uh, from the De Morgan Foundation. Um, okay, so let's get started. What we have upstairs in Leighton House with the Alma Tadema exhibition is an artist studio hall of mirrors. Within Leighton's studio working space, our curators foreground Al Matadema's collaboratively forged studio houses and the myriad ways they're represented and refracted in his, Laura and Anna's paintings. One of the many revelations in this context is the way the studio was transposed into the space of Al Matadema's classical paintings. So too, we're invited to contemplate how familial relations in this creative space are built into the intimacies of viewing their art as, for example, this touching 25-year wedding anniversary gift that invokes a venerable tradition of the artist at work while making creative inspiration a matter of domestic intimacy. The mirrored image of Alma Tadema places him in front of and in the background of this painting a compositional move recalling an art historical lineage back to Vermeer and Velazquez. And this happens through an encounter with a shared love of painting expressed in the family's affectionate gazes at Laura and Lawrence's wedding portrait. It's, a compelling, it's compellingly expressed by those hands along the lower edge whose mutual touching invokes the intimate affection of familial looking that this closely cropped grouping compels. My talk this afternoon focuses on Leighton's studio and his Arab hall. Like Alma Tadema's home, it was a semi-public space made famous through written accounts by visitors. Where the Alma Tadema studio house was a space of familial collaboration, the agar plate for the work of Laura Lawrence and, and Anna, Leighton's home was a gentleman's bachelor pad. But it too was the creative outcome of collaboration between Leighton, his architect George Atchison, ceramicist William de Morgan, and Walter Crane, among others. The inclusion of over a thousand tiles by unknown master craftsmen from Iznik, Damascus, and Persia begs a question as to what role their creative practice plays in this space. My paper is an effort, effort to assay the contribution of this range of practitioners by exploring the process of crafting the Arab Hall and the cultural geography of Leighton's creative practice. Let's start for a moment in Leighton's studio and with what is now a door to nowhere. The purpose of this oversized aperture created in 1868 was to enable large canvases such as his processional paintings to be carried out of his studio the paintings on which Leighton staked his reputation as an ambitious artist. Ten years earlier, in Rome, Leighton finished his initial large processional painting that his peers characterised as the first result of his cosmopolitan education. It thematises art in transit, a procession through the streets of Florence as Cimabue's painting is carried from the artist's studio to Santa Maria Novella. <laughs> 
It's a worldly painting about generational artistic inheritance, with the young Giotto walking hand in hand with his teacher, Cimabue. Leighton creates a geography of art practice firmly rooted in Western Europe, and this meta-painting secured his claim as an ambitious history painter at a time when the efficacy of that genre was uncertain. This photograph of Leighton from the early 1880s shows him at work in his Holland Park studio on another of his paintings that thematizes aestheticism. The story from Boccaccio's De Cameron is about the transformation of the brutish Simon, who's arrested by the beauty of sleeping Iphigenia. In contrast to Cimabue's Florentine procession, this is an otherworldly setting. And transformation occurs at a moment of human passivity. The lunar metaphor for awakening implied by that ellipsis on the horizon that touches the night sky is matched by non-naturalistic light radiating from Iphigenia onto the base of those tree trunks behind her. This painting subject, beauty as transformation, is elaborated through colour and light. Four years before creating this painting, the function of the door on the west wall of the studio was neutralised by the construction of the Arab Hall, built between 1877 and 79. Its dome structure blocked the transit of artworks from this opening. When prints of his painting, Solitude and the Bath of Psyche, were hung on that door frame, it became an aestheticised threshold. Unlike Alma Tadema, Leighton rarely represented his home in his paintings, but the Arab Hall is one of Leighton's most important aestheticist works, in which are played out some of his most pressing concerns. The Arab Hall was an experiment in synthesizing disparate impulses between art for art's sake as a withdrawal from the world and cosmopolitan worldliness, between the collector's historicist impulse towards Islamic art and its synthesis into contemporary British practice. For me, this interior proves compelling precisely at the points where that project of synthesis falters and we begin to see its disruptive fragments. Throughout this talk, I'll set Leighton's Arab Hall into dialogue with the other spaces of his home in order to understand the fluid geography of his Orientalism. Leighton's house was a site of habitation, creative practice, and an evolving work of art, a space into and out of which objects, artworks, and persons traveled. I thus read this remnant doorframe in his studio as a marker of the spatio-temporal changes wrought upon this interior through construction of the Arab Hall, and as a reminder that our interpretation of his Orientalist edition should be attuned to the changing lines of flight within his networked interior. Let's consider the decade before the Arab Hall's construction, when Leighton was amassing the historic Islamic art that he used to create this space. It was also the period in which he worked on a portrait of renowned Orientalist Richard Burton. Both became central to Leighton's Orientalist aestheticism. Among the many pieces of Islamic art that Leighton amassed, including stained glass windows and mashrabia, those lattice screens, I conjecture that it was the historic wall tiles that placed the greatest demands on these British artists. Sourcing, restoring, and resolving how to fit them within the interior was challenging. The majority of them are polychromatic underglazed Damascus tiles with a smaller number of blue and white 16th and 17th century Iznik pieces. There are a few, and there are a few Persian lusterware and figurative tiles. They came from domestic and sacred contexts and were sourced from within the Ottoman Empire. Leighton saw spectacular examples of Ottoman tile panelling during his first trip to Istanbul and Bursa in 1867. In Bursa, he created this oil sketch of the madrasa within the Muradiye Mosque complex. The intimacy of this enclosed courtyard setting and the recessed tiled walls resonates with his Arab Hall project. Within the grounds of the Muradiye Mosque complex, Leighton would also have seen Iznik tile panels such as these on the top left within the tomb of Sultan Suleiman's son, Shezade Mustafa. This is some of the most refined Ottoman Iznik tile production and the resonances between the exterior of that tomb and the exterior of the Arab Hall is also notable. Leighton purchased this uh, tiles during this trip, but quickly realised that in order to get sufficient historic pieces for his, his interior, he needed access to better local networks. So he came to rely on William Wright, missionary and amateur antiquarian based in Damascus from 1865 to 75, Richard Burton, diplomat, explorer and scholar of Arabic culture, and Caspar Purden-Clark from the South Kensington Museum. <laughs> 
The wall tiles that came from religious structures, of which there are quite a few in the Arab Hall, are the most contentious. Local dealers, officials, and caretakers of such sites sometimes facilitated the dislodgement and sale of tiles, but there was often lo local pushback to prevent their removal. Richard Burton's letter to Leighton discloses the role of local custodians when he writes that his friends had, and I quote, nobbled a score or so of tiles from the Mosque of Omar. Large stores are there found, but un unhappily under the charge of the vakif, and I fancy that long payments would be required. He's referring to the surplus Iznik tiles created during Sultan Suleiman's restoration of the Dome of the Rock in the mid-16th century. Leighton's collecting in the 1870s occurred in the context of a growing recognition of the historic and aesthetic value of such tiles by Ottoman authorities and intellectuals that is exemplified by the Ottoman architecture book of 1873. And up here are two pages of the tile illustrations from this book published by the Ottoman state. The majority of Leighton's panels came from Damascus at a time when many historic domestic domestic interiors were dismantled for European collectors. Economic downturn in this provincial Ottoman city was catalyzed by the political upheavals of the 1860s. Burton wrote to Leighton from Damascus in 1871, offering to have a house pulled down. Burton also reveals how competitive this market for tiles was. William Wright recognized that tumultuous political circumstances conditioned the supply side of this local market for historic items, noting that the spoils of the late massacre were still in concealment. Through friends, however, Leighton and I got access to several stores of gold embroidered fa fabrics, costly robes. Wright's knowledge of ancient pottery kilns in Damascus where Kashani ware had been fired gave Leighton access to tiles, plates, and long neck jars. These documentary fragments reveal the destruction that was part of this collecting process when it involved wall tiles. It was not the disrupted integrity of the local structures that concerned these men, but rather that the damaged fragments would not suit Leighton's purpose. Burton reported from Trieste in 1876 that the tiles are packed and will be sent by the first London steamer. Some are perfect, many are broken, but they'll make a bit of mosaic after a little trimming. When this letter arrived in London, Leighton was basking in the critical success at the Summer Royal Academy of his portrait of Burton. Rendering the battle-scarred face of this Orientalist adventurer took many years to complete, over which time Burton's scar became crucial to Leighton's aesthetics. Applauding the portrait, the critic for the London Daily News invokes an historic precedent for rendering the Orientalist adventurer, suggesting that Burton has taken a hint from Cromwell by having that side of his face painted, which shows a deep gash. The critic well, cites a well-rehearsed anecdote where Cromwell's reputed to have insisted to his portraitist Lely, and I quote, use all of your skill to paint my picture truly like me, including all of these roughnesses, pimples, warts, and everything as you see me, otherwise I will never pay a farthing for it. It's an economical reference for the Victorian critic, where Burton's dermal anomalies simultaneously became an index of mimetic veracity and heroic character. Burton's face was scarred by a spear from a Somali attack in Babera in 1855. But Cromwell's sitting was an imperfect analogy. Leighton may have been working under quite the opposite instruction from his notoriously irascible sitter. According to his wife Isabel, Burton was anxious the painter not render him ugly. At this precise moment in Burton's rocky career, it's a plea to Leighton, the darling of the art establishment, to ennoble him in paint. Burton, by his own admission, is an unlikely candidate for Leighton's brush that dwells in the realm of the beautiful. Yet the transaction turned out to be mutually beneficial. In William Wright's account of the transaction in Leighton's studio, Burton parodied the process where the sitter is conventionally required to perform their most flattering self. This contrary version of the sitting is equally viable given Burton's studied posturing as an institutional outsider. Between the two accounts, Burton emerges as a characteristically unreliable historical subject. Comparing Burton's photographic and painterly scar shows us that this too was an unreliable scar. <laughs> Comparison reveals the painter's editorial process as one rather than three scars are visible. The isolated painted scar maintains a sinuous line that elegantly contours the left cheek, widening and softening as it joins the dark shadow of Burton's cheekbone. 
I would go so far as to say that he's rendered the particular beauty of this scar. It's an aestheticised wound. What this photograph cannot be made to answer is the colour of that scar. If Burton's skin was prone to keloid scarring, as suggested by the raised scar near his lip, his larger scar might have maintained its redness. If not, then the redness would have receded by the times of the sitting to Leighton. It's an epistemologically unstable scar. Either way, the red skin of the painting pleats time and space. It's an affective intensification of pa in paint that compels the viewer's gaze through visceral proximity to adventure and risk. Burton's skin is a bravura demonstration of Leighton's impasto brushwork and subtle colouring that invokes skin marked by age and adventure. Critics asserted that the portrait's strength of character injected vigour into Leighton's practice. The Saturday Review wrote that, and I quote, to gain power, Leighton exchanges his usual smooth surface for a rough texture loaded with pigments, which stands out in absolute relief, thus extremes meet. Even the critic who found fault with a certain shininess of superficial effect subscribed to a notion of the painting's living skin, conjecturing that this effect in the work will perhaps wear off in time. The portrait was even said to have had a redeeming effect on Leighton's much criticised large processional painting, Daphnephoria, that was shown in the same exhibition. The Burton portrait lends our cosmopolitan painter a rugged worldliness. Risk has become red paint in layered substrata on canvas that is now Burton and Leighton's rugged beauty. No wonder Leighton continued to hold this portrait close, hanging it in his stairwell nearby a portrait of himself by Frederick Watts. Visitors encountered it as they transited between the artist's Arab hall and his studio. This illustration of Leighton's studio from the building news of December 1876 is a provoking condensation of ideas about the significance of the aesthetic work of the portrait. The painting has picked up speed in its radically foreshortened incarnation, cutting its way through the left side of the image, converging at the edge of the door used to remove large paintings, as if poised to leave the studio through this aperture. The portrait seems to have taken the place of his large canvases in its ambitions and its effects in the world. In the same month that this illustration was published, Caspar Purden Clark set out on a purchasing trip to the Near East. He augmented the South Kensington Museum's holdings of what was becoming the most significant collection of Damascus tiles outside Syria. He also purchased these two panels that were used to establish symmetry on the west wall of the Arab Hall. By this time, Leighton had what he needed to create his Orientalist interior, so building commenced in 1877. Leighton and Acheson drew on La Ziza, the 12th century summer palace in Palermo, as the main prototype for the Arab Hall. Leighton's artistic centre of gravity was Italy, so it's unsurprising that medieval Palermo was the template for his Orientalist interior. It was a port city with a history of cultural traffic across the Mediterranean that produced hybrid aesthetic forms. But Ziza was an unsteady historical referent for this Orientalist interior. The building's cultural attribution had been a matter for academic dispute since the late 18th century. Disagreements hinged on whether this structure was built by the Normans or the Arabs. It, its historiography has elements of an academic detective fiction, with counterfeited documents, fictional histories, and failures in translation. In 1795, the prevailing opinion that it was an Arab structure was unsteadied when Professor Giuseppe Vella was convicted of counterfeiting the Arabic documents on which his attributions were based. From then on, debates focused on the building's damaged Kufic inscriptions. Untranslated, they self-evidently declared it an Arab building. In 1827, Salvatore Morso threw the Arab origins of the structure into doubt, convinced he'd deciphered the name of Norman King Roger in the Kufic. His la translation later proved incorrect. The puzzle was finally solved by Michel Amari, whose accurate translation established that the building was erected under the patronage of Norman King William I and completed by his son, William II. Amari's findings were disseminated in his book on the Arabic epigraphs of Sicily, published in 1875, two years before the Arab Hall was built. Ziza was rendered part of the picturesque history of Sicily in 19th century British illustrated travelogues. In 
When British readers encountered Galley Knight's rendition of the site in 1838, they understood they were looking at an Arab structure in Mediterranean Europe. Within a few decades, however, it became a legacy of the Norman conquest, thus bringing the structure a little closer to home through links to Britain's Norman history. Just as classical Ottoman architecture and its tiled ornament was being embraced by the Ottoman imperial authorities in the 1870s as part of a new historicism that bolstered the Ottoman imperial self-image, so too Laziza was being remade for the project of Sicilian patriotism by Michel Amari. He was a man of the barricades as well as a scholar, an Italian nationalist who worked in exile in Paris after his involvement in the 1848 uprisings. Amari supported Sicilian resistance to Bourbon occupation. Ziza and other Arabo-Norman structures were entangled in these nationalist aspirations. In Amari's writings, they stood for Sicily's unique character due to its variegated Mediterranean history. By the time building commenced on Leighton's Arab Hall in 1877, the academic attribution puzzle had been solved, but the rich narrative of the interpretive instabilities of this transcultural architecture pertains to our thinking about the imaginative geography of Leighton's Hall, in particular the Arabic inscriptions that hover between decoration and legibility depending upon the viewer's linguistic skills. While drawing on the geometry of Ziza's Fountain Hall, Atchison created an interior with a more internally focused logic. The self-contained pool in the Arab Hall retreats from its urban context, whereas Ziza's water channels flowed into a garden. Atchison disdained slavish copying of parts styles, thus the interior is a synthesis derived from multiple Mediterranean sources. Leighton distanced himself from realist Orientalism, and so in his Arab Hall, historic fragments were put into service, as he stated, for the sake of something beautiful to look at. An historicist impulse of admiring collected treasures is ideally subsumed within aesthetic experience. Published accounts by visitors disclose the experiential poetics of this Orientalism. For them, the Arab Hall functioned as a Gesamtkunstwerk that existed under the impulse of the beautiful. In 1882, Mary Huys offers an asceticist reading of this space, not dissecting the interior, but instead evoking its points of interest. Beginning in the Narcissus Hall, she declares it a compelling affective interpretation of the classical theme that eschews narrative in favour of dispersed colour and light. Huys praises its poetic originality, and I quote, it is not repeating point blank the hackneyed tale or showing the fair boy adoring his mirrored self in the lily paven lake, but just recalling it piecemeal. The lilies in the pavement, the shining lake above in the gilded ceiling, and all the joys and sorrow, the luxury and pain of his loneliness and aberration, told by the colours, the purple and the gloom. Architecture becomes an experience of pure colour, and she continues, the deep shades of the corners are filled with tarsia work and porcelain, but as in a well-coloured picture, these are absolutely subservient, and the impression is purple, like a Greek midnight, circling around a point of softest green, the bronze boy, and falling into a warm grey on the floor. This reading of a narcissistically absorbing interior, where abstracted effects of light and colour are more compelling than narrative, accord with the aesthetic experience Leighton evoked in his odalisk painting created in the studio upstairs after completion of his Arab hall. This painting withholds the mirrored image of our absorbed odalisk and instead shows us the fascinating coloured pattern fabric that she holds out. Our eye is drawn downwards to the exquisite embroidered sleeve of her gown and downwards to the back of the beautiful gold embroidered cloak of her young assistant. Fields of patterned paint are the subject of this work. It was in this painting that Leighton most directly rendered his Arab Hall as a site for such aesthetic experiments on canvas. In Wilfred Meinl's account of 1881, a former Persian man of taste hovers in the Arab Hall, and like Leighton's Odalisk, he's an abstracted person from a mythical Near East. The tiles prompt him to reflect on their origin in another interior commissioned by, and I quote, some long dead and gone Muslim who owned a stately pleasure dome like that of Sir Frederick Leighton's, who had cultivated taste and was a patron of the arts. <laughs> 
this ghostly Persian patron contrasts starkly with the historical specificity of the cult of ancestors in Ottoman texts of this period and to the visceral immediacy of Burton's portrait in the nearby stairwell. In the Arab hall, abstract effects of colour are staged through an orchestration of light. The gilded dome dissolves the weight of architecture as stained glass windows transform light into coloured gems. In 1892, Harry Howe conveys the visual and oral dimensions of this experience, writing, I stand beneath the great gilt dome and the sun which is shining causes it to sparkle with a thousand gems. On looking up, the dome seems to lose itself far away. It's a place in which to sit and dream, for there is not, not a sound except the gentle splashing from the fountain. There are numerous precedents for this poetics of light in Islamic religious structures where architectural effects of radiance were often accompanied by images of the hanging lamp in a niche and calligraphic inscriptions of the light verse from the Quran linking luminosity, Allah and paradise. Leighton saw mosques and tombs where such messages were architecturally encoded. After visiting Damascus in 1873, he celebrated the effects of light and colour in that city's great Umayyad mosque in this painting of its Qibla wall. The mosque lamp panel on the east wall brings this Islamic iconography into the Arab hall while displacing its numinous connotations in favour of secular aestheticism. Close scrutiny shows it's an amalgam formed from a larger series of panels. The disjointed candle on the right, the discontinuous chain suspending the lamp on the left, and the disrupted arch speak to the ruptures of this transposition. But those inclined towards an aestheticist reading of the Arab Hall saw no such disjunctions. For them, synthesis in this interior created a harmony that dissolves temporal distance between the historic tiles and the contemporary British interior. French architect Choisy expressed this effect of collapsed time, writing, uh, writing that the harmony is so perfect that one asks oneself if the enamels were created for the architecture, or the, or the um, sorry, if, if the architecture has been conceived for the enamels or the enamels for the hall. While the reception hall at La Ziza provided a regular geometric template for harmonising the historic tiles that were transposed into this modern interior, the tile panels have an ontology of stasis that has to be reckoned with. Ceramic vases, jugs and other products of the Damascus, Damascus and Isnik potters' kilns were designed to be on the move, whereas wall tiles designed for specific sites have a greater resistance to mobility. The Arab Hall's tile panels were designed for other interiors. There are many partial panels in this room. Their history of dislocation from other walls is legible in their fragmentary remnants and scarred surfaces. This obdurate materiality posed an impediment to an aesthetics of synthesis. Meinl understood this challenge when he wrote that the task of adapting separate pieces to the walls without breaking the design after the chances and hazards of collection and transportation was no easy matter. It was necessary to call on the modern occidental skill of Mr. William de Morgan. William de Morgan, it seems, was not entirely convinced that his work on this project was an unmitigated success. In order to understand the craftsman's misgivings, I think we need to look closely at the imperfections on the East Wall. The visit, visitor initially experiences the coherence of tile panels because those encountered upon first entering this room on the west wall are the most intact. Aesthetic synthesis is a harder ask from the vantage point of the east wall where the signs of the struggle to craft the Arab hall are barely concealed. Aitchison's drawings show he distilled his own version of this east wall, changing the configuration of panels and restoring multi-tiled panels back to a unified design. The panel on the right-hand pillar in Leighton House, for example, appears on the left wall in Aitchison's drawing. He added two more rows of the Ogival blue lattice and replaced the misfit tile second from the bottom that interrupts the flow of this pattern. The uniformity of his delicate illustration suggests that Aitchison might have preferred the interior were made in, of entirely new tiles by de Morgan. Leighton, however, valued the quality of this period of Islamic art and wrote to his father of their intense gorgeousness uh, when he saw the tiled interiors in Damascus in 1873. 
For him, this collaboration to harmonise old and new tiles could well have resonated with his own struggles with painterly process upstairs in the studio, in which the meticulous labour of the multi-stages of making his paintings was ideally subsumed by the apparent effortlessness of the finished work. De Morgan's work in the Arab Hall was undertaken at a relatively early stage of a career that's notable for an experimental working process. He submitted to the task of replicating glaze, glaze effects of historic ceramics with the goal of eventually creating new designs. His great challenge was Persian lusterware. In 1892, he delivered a paper on this topic. The first part is a history of luster glaze. The second half is advice to other ceramicists, recounting failed experiments to replicate the finest Persian techniques. In this essay, there's a marked shift in tone from the certainty of the historian to the provisional present tense of the experimental craft worker. There's plenty of evidence of de Morgan's experimental mode in the Arab Hall, and his results are there to be tested against their historic precedents. In this interior, de Morgan embarked upon quite a number of different tasks. He created all of the new peacock blue tiles that harmonized the disparate historic tiles. He also undertook the task of creating a synthesis from disparate panels and tile parts, as for example with the mosque lamp panel. He also engaged in the more difficult task of replicating tile parts to repair some of the panels that arrived in the British capital in a ruinous state. Replicating existing work is no easy task, even for an experienced ceramicist. The results demonstrate varying degrees of success. By undertaking this work, de Morgan submits to an apprenticeship across time, as the products of his kiln are answerable to the superb precedence of the absent master craftsman. De Morgan achieved some impressive results. With this lunette, for example, he created the two central blue tiles that are hard to distinguish from the originals. With others, he took creative license. As Venetia Porter observes, the lions attaching, attacking onagers at the base of this panel, unlikely inclusions in Syrian tile work, are probably transposed from Persian sources. Although it doesn't have the polychromatic range of the Damascus panel that we've just been looking at, this Isnic tile pair on the east wall presented a more exacting challenge. De Morgan created the triangular fragment for the upper right corner of the left tile in an effort to complete the pair. He's made a pretty good approximation, one that only an experienced ceramicist could produce, and from a distance, in the muted light of the Arab hall, it harmonizes. But if we look more closely, we see the shortcomings of his response to this technical challenge. Let's work our way towards this process of creation of the repair fragment from the material evidence. The initial challenge was to create the shape of this tile insert to judge the correct size allowing for shrinkage of the fritware base in the first firing stage. The shortcomings at this stage are evident in the band of routing that he overpainted after the panel was attached to the wall. It's an intervention to minimize the visual impact of this scar, one that has deteriorated over time. The next challenge was to match the creamy white glaze by modifying the stark white of a tin glaze base. Next, he creates the continuous pattern across the fragment, diluting his cobalt glaze to varying strength to create the pattern of spiraling vines and flower heads. It's probably, it probably involved multiple glaze firings. His is not a bad effort, but close inspection of the results suggests it was a humbling process. Judgments had to be made as to how much to dilute the cobalt blue to match the color range in the Isnik original. On the top left of the fragment, there are patches where it's too dark. At this stage, the potter is working intuitively, working blind because the layers of glaze color that he lays down prior to the firing bear no relation to the color that will appear from the kiln. And the efforts of the firing are hard to predict. The bleeding of some of de Morgan's lines are likely the result of firing at a temperature that's slightly too high. As a result, he fails to achieve the crisp edges of the Isnik original. The tips of the leaves on these tiles reveal most clearly the sure hand of the Isnik glaziers, something that de Morgan has not executed with the same finesse. De Morgan experimented over an extended period to create the replacement pieces for the hall and discarded many of his failed attempts. 
When he looked at these walls with the eyes of, the make, of a maker, the shortcomings of the kind that I've been pointing out would have been as obvious to him as the harmonies he'd created working with this fine collection of historic tiles by Near Eastern master craftsmen. The aestheticist fantasy of synthesis, of rending the distant historic time of production into a harmonious aesthetic present tense, is, a harder, is harder to sustain when reading these surfaces from the perspective of the craftsman. For de Morgan, it seems, such imagined harmony could only really be achieved through his drawings. This sheet is one of the few surviving working drawings related to the Arapaul Commission. There must have been many such sketches in de Morgan as de Morgan planned his repairs. Here he's worked with the Isnik tile fragments, distilling them into a continuous pattern unbroken by the original tile segments and later fractures. He's replicated the tile pair and extended beyond them to conjure the larger pattern, thus gesturing towards the wall of the tomb of Ayyub Sultan in Istanbul for which these tiles were originally made. And here you see the exterior of that tomb, one of the city's most venerated religious sites where other parts of this tile panelling remain. Two further tiles from the series are in the Victoria and Albert Museum and three in the British Museum. De Morgan's drawings show he's discovered that for the pattern to be continuous, there has to be a reversal of the tiles in every second row. He went on to replicate this pattern in a tile series that's now in the De Morgan Foundation collection, and you see it up here. Like, Atchison, drawings, like Atchison's drawings of the Arab Hall, De Morgan's work on paper aspires to distill wholeness, but de Morgan's drawing does so by imagining another wall in Istanbul into being, of which the Arab Hall pair is but a metonymic fragment. Like Burton's portrait, scarring was part of an aesthetics of beauty in the Arab Hall, but these are different scars in paint and grout, with their own material and aesthetic logic. Where Burton's scars signified Orientalist agency, de Morgan's ceramic scars are more equivocal, marking the effort to repair and its failure. The scars within the Arab Hall signal a desire to resolve an aesthetic distance between past and present, as these British artists collaborated to equal and surpass their historic sources by synthesizing early modern Eastern material culture into contemporary British aestheticism. But the brokenness opens a wound that can't be healed. In failed synthesis, there's an eruption of the past into the present. Early modern Islamic art is not locked out of modernity and predictably chronologically consigned to the past of art's history. Instead, through aesthetic judgment, agency is on the side of the early modern and decline on that of contemporary British craft. Here is early modern Islamic art's resistant materiality. Throughout this lecture, I've been moving between paintings created upstairs and the Arab Hall downstairs. So let's transit those stairs once more in 1896, just after Leighton's death, when works were placed around his coffin in the studio. Moving up the stairs, we pass the portrait of Burton, whose heroic imperfections were a mark of Leighton's cosmopolitanism. On the right of Leighton's encased body, is Clytie, his great allegory of the pain of lost love. It was incomplete at the time of Leighton's death. Earthbound on her knees, Clytie is an embodied evocation of imminent metamorphosis into the rooted sunflower cursed to forever follow the sun god Apollo, severed from union. The sadness of desire is embodied in the deathly green on the underside of those arms, whose top edges are still momentarily warmed by the compelling radiant impasto of that sky. Apollo in paint, human longing for art's enduring beauty, moving towards sunset. At that moment, in that place, this unfinished painting painfully encapsulates Leighton's aesthetics. Perhaps more optimistic is the work facing his coffin, not a classical narrative, one, but one from an imagination cast further east. His fair Persian, whose open radiant beauty holds elusive promise. It's a temporary installation, halted work in progress. Leighton's body and his artworks will leave this place. Burton's portrait entered the National Portrait Gallery where it still hangs, enshrining the now ambivalent heroism of the man that since the publication of Edward Said's book has come to stand for the most exploitive impulses of European Orientalism. <laughs> 
Clytie will restlessly travel the world, including a journey to Australia in the early 2000s, where I felt, first felt her consuming sadness, returning eventually to the walls of Leighton House, where she now rests. And in what seems like a fitting twist of fate, the fair Persian's whereabouts are unknown. But what are those, those tiles and the Arab hall downstairs? Most of the contents of the home were dispersed in the sale of 1896. The fate of Leighton's house was uncertain upon his death. The tiles remain in situ due to the efforts of loyal supporters. The most hyperbolic claim for Leighton's Arab Hall as the high point of his aestheticism was made by Caspar Purden Clark, who wrote that the Arab Hall is the most beautiful structure which has been raised since the 16th century. This comment, I think, dramatizes how far Leighton's reputation fell in the 20th century. His particular version of aestheticist formalism didn't fit the bill of modernist art histories. It was Byrne Jones who articulated unease at the configuration of historic tiles in the Arab Hall, as he put it, all those splendid things from the East built up in such a silly way. Byrne Jones expresses what Leighton, Aitchison and de Morgan would have seen as perhaps the most troubling potential consequence of their Arab Hall, that the displaced and damaged tiles might exceed the aesthetic value of this modern British interior. Like these historic tiles, and for some, because of them, aestheticist synthesis in Leighton's Arab Hall proves to be a fragile proposition. Thank you. So it's an exhausted time of day. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Ray. That was wonderful. Um, I wonder actually if we might be able to go back to um, sun gleams because it's mm -hmm. such an interesting piece and it's yeah. such a shame that we don't have a colour yes. version of it. Um, yeah. But I was just wondering if you could maybe use that painting to just reflect some more on your themes of these, like, this idea of synthesis and interiority of, of the kind of unity in that image between yeah, the kind of aestheticized woman and the aestheticized interior and I guess with the kind of yeah the this niche here which is kind of disparate yeah. panels as well which she kind of half covers yeah just reflect on that with some of yes the well Thank we you. yes we can certainly see Look, I really wish this painting will come to light. And if anyone in this room knows where it is, please let us know. Because I think the intriguing thing is to think about the kind of questions I would ask of this painting is precisely how textured or how precise Leighton's brushwork is in rendering those tiles. Um, because, of course, as you can see, these are, these are different tiles in the, in the centre of that panel. So it is an amalgam of, of disparate tiles. I think one of the things that I find really interesting about this painting is it's the one where he must have moved into the Arab Hall to actually paint at least part of it. So it's that sense of the kind of journeying around the house um, and the idea of the, the Arab Hall as a site that, that even if momentarily it may have become a studio or, or a, a site for his own uh, artistic practice, that, that interests me as well. So to follow up on this metaphor of sort of travel through the house, but also travel beyond it. Um, I think also there's some commentaries, contemporary commentaries about seeing this work in the house. And I, I can't remember for the moment who it is that actually writes it, but they talk about being, being reminded that there's a British politician who's, who's also in that space and suddenly they're pulled back to how the, the debates that have been in the, in the parliament recently. And so there's this really interesting idea of the, the dream that kind of the bubble is burst. Um, and I think that's quite fascinating that, that the Arab Hall lends that prospect of transport. And then of course, because of its interiority and that moment where you might feel as if you're being transported somewhere qu quite other. Um, and, you know, the Odd List paintings are interesting to me because, of course, the question of gender. How does one get at them when they're actually aestheticist paintings? And it's, it's these women, these imagined Odd Lists, who become the kind of vehicle for transport. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, yes, sure. um, Mary, you talked about the um, poetics of light and mm. radiance. And I just mm. wanted to ask you a question about colour. 
because yeah. even, even on the digital screen, that the blues and the greens, and of course when you're there in person, that sort of enveloping sense of the intensity yeah. of colour. Mm. And it's quite interesting because it's not everywhere, is it? And you really made me think about the spaces in between tiles and obviously the, the lighter colours of grout and the spaces in between the leaves and the peacocks and whatever we have, um, they, they are significant because they bring that colour. And then, of course, you've got that block of um, the De Morgan peacock blue tiles, but which are not just one blue, they're, they're iridescent. So whether there's something about the significance of blue um, or whether that colour and the, the effects of that colour were discussed at the time and are part of this um, imaginative travel that you are talking about. Absolutely. And I think that comes back to understandings that the Orient and colour are so closely associated. Um, you know, we can move across the channel and think about Delacroix, of course, and, and other, other artists for whom Orientalism and colour and the light of the East is also such a significant thing. But I think what's interesting, I guess, about this is actually the ways in which low lighting um, allows for the, the dramatisation of it. And it was just so wonderful to be there last night and to, to look at the stairwell and see the, the gold actually glinting and gleaming. And um, Also, I guess, one of the things I'm interested in terms of this relationship between colour and light is those for whom, you know, I'm, via De Morgan, I'm actually doing a kind of forensic looking that, that has turned all the lights up and, and is probably in his own studio where he's, you know, figuring out in his, in his workshop, trying to figure out, is this good enough? Um, because, of course, then we're looking at different kinds of gazing at this effects of colour and light because there's such a disjunction between those who really buy it as an aestheticist uh, work of art and then, and then some sensibility that, that is less than convinced by that. And I must say now going into that hall, I feel on the one hand last night this sense of like, this is incredibly calm. And then, <laughs> then you also sort of, the, the, actually the, the light and shade last night actually also allowed us to see the kind of shattered nature of some of those in the Narcissus Hall, that panel above on the wall there. And so I can't help thinking about this kind of process of scarring and, and, and what that, how that resonates in terms of particularly wall tiles. It's the materiality of the wall tiles and their own, their own status that interests me in this respect. very much, Mary. Um, I want to um, ask you to think a little bit more about that scarring and whether it is as, as um, pronounced as one sees it in the forensic way you're looking at yeah. it in the context of the entire Arab hall and whether a, an equivalent of that can be seen in those scarred monuments, the Ottoman monuments, the places where the tiles are removed from or replaced. Yeah. The whole of the Dome of the Rock is actually itself a, a, an afterthought, a, an addition of a yeah. later moment. So if, if there is some sense of that link between Leighton's aestheticism and a, a local, if you will, aestheticism, in other words, he is not yeah. so much an outsider aestheticism, from inside. Yeah, asceticism does begin to develop in late 19th century Istanbul or amongst an elite, and this project is situated within an examination of Osman Hamdi Bey and his studio and the ways in which he's also collecting these treasures and replicating them. I would argue, I've actually argued that his work, which is so often seen as, because he's a student of Boulanger's and associated with Jerome, he's so often associated with realist orientalism. I've actually put forth an argument that in fact his work is aestheticist and we need to think about the connection between his work and these collections of decorative tiles and so forth um, and, and, and really take into account of the, the sort of repetitions and rhythms and the colour with patterns within that work that, that w really would be an argument for aestheticism. But you also ask another question about the status of those tombs and mosques and so forth. I've done some work on, uh, on British Vice Consul William Henry Wrench, who collected some of the works. We know, we know that these were taken off the walls of the tomb of um, Sultan Suleiman the Se uh, Selim II in the Topkapi, uh, in the Hagia Sophia courtyard. And you can see there, you know, where the where segments of the tile panelling have actually been painted as substitutes for the, th the stolen tiles. And, but there is also, you know, even with the, the tomb at Ayyub Sultan, so many of those tile walls actually have, have a whole history that's not just about Western theft. 
There is also, I think, um, a history of these tiles that has to be written and that's very difficult to get at for, for, uh, that doesn't just set it as a kind of British or French colonial project that also sees it as part of a larger history and a longer history of these works. This may be a very silly question, but I'll take the risk. Um, the fascinating way you deal with, with the scaring and, and the damaging of the, of, the, of the tiles immediately called to mind another discussion of scarred tiles by Linda Nochlin in Jean-Léon Jean Jérôme's um, Snake Enchanter, isn't it? Yes, in but Snake Charmer. But there I think the yeah. scars, if I remember correctly, are, are read as signaling the decay of the Ottoman culture, while here, you, you reverse that, that, that kind of reading where we have to read in this caring precisely the resistance against Western appropriation maybe of um, Ottoman culture. So is there any, any way in, in, in which you can relate your reading to, to Nocklin's reading? Yes, actually I, I do. I mean, I think I'm, in my approach to these tiles is very much, and in a long-standing way, being in conversation with precisely that. And it's a great joy to be in Williamstown where that work is held at the Clark and to have had conversations. And the Alma Tadema piano is indeed back now in the same room as that. So the connections here are, are very uh, fecund. What interests me about that, I guess I, I reject her reading that it's solely about the neglect of the Eastern custodians, even though I think it's possible to go in that direction. But I think if you actually look at the photograph from the Abdullah Frere, the Armenian photographers, of that corridor from the Altenyol in the 19th century that he would have used because he was in correspondence with them and met them when he was in Istanbul, that, that what he's done is actually taken those cracks and re remove them to more peripheral parts of the, he's repaired some of those tiles on canvas as well as cracked other parts of it. And that to me is actually about creating something that gives you a sense of the age of the tiles, but also is um, giving a sense of the sort of aesthetic harmony of these panels as well. So I think there's a more subtle story there to be told. But one of the things that interests me about putting together the history of these tiles and thinking about their resistant materiality is it then really sh throws into sharp relief how much the painted surface is a playground for these Orientalists and indeed for these Ottoman painters in a way that the materiality of the tiles d doesn't necessarily allow for. Um, so it's, it's this di material difference and it comes back to things we were talking about in the first session about surface, um, fracture versus the slick surface, the shiny surface. Um, here the, it, it's, it, it turns around a whole set of material properties related to the brittle nature of... The extraordinary thing about tiles is, to, to my mind, is that they look ageless when they're in perfect condition and then the minute that they're broken, that their signs of age emerge. Um, and, and that, to me, is quite curious in terms of your paper and the thinking that's been bubbling along across the day about temporality and how we're thinking about the past in the present. Just thinking about Burton's scar, the painting was reproduced within a year of its production in a journal called The Portfolio. Mm. And I've just had a good look online. The Met has an impression. And the scar is almost imperceptible in that reproduction. Interesting. So um, did Leighton tinker with the scar later on, say, or, or did the etcher choose to obliterate the scar? He almost looks like he doesn't have a scar at all, actually, in the reproduction. Interesting. Um, no, I don't think he tinkers with the scar later on, although it does take a very long time for him to complete that painting. He, act, it's in the, he works on it for a long time. Um, yeah, does anyone else in this room know whether, whether that painting... I don't think so. Did you hear the yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's a very busy row right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, actually, you know, I wonder whether... Because when I looked at that, that illustration, in fact, the scar to me looked like it was even darker. So I wonder whether that's actually a bad PDF of it, because it looked to me like the kind of, what I'm arguing is the kind of beauty of, if we're thinking about the same illustration, but the beauty of that scar has almost become something very marked in the face, but let's leave that as a, <laughs> something pending. <laughs>
Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for a, a really stimulating paper. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, mm. Morris's mm. anti scrape, um, yeah. founded just about this time, late 1870s. Mm. Uh, you know, the, I've no idea if they engaged at all with um, these kinds of works and the sort of expropriation of, of panels of tiles and so on. They were certainly very um, anxious about what was being done to St. Mark's in Venice, to the restoration of the mosaics on the facade of the Basilica. Um, but thinking about what they were doing in this country, um, they were, of course, advocating um, propping up historic buildings, but being very careful in distinguishing between historic fabric and later additions. And that kind of carries mm. on. You so know, how does sort of, I mean, is, is Burne Jones' dismissal of this project to do with that and to do with his friendship with Morris? How does, you know, is, is Leighton interested in these sorts of things, aware of these sorts of things? I, th I think what interests me about the Arab Hall is the way in which, as a project, it sets a set of, it rela it's, it's within a context where Islamic art is being collected for its historic and aesthetic potential in the South Kensington Museum. And, and Leighton's sense of what's historically valuable, clearly when he's reflecting on the gorgeousness of these tiles, there's, there's a certain value in that. But I don't think there's any troubling of conscience about acquisition of them. And in fact, you know, the, the vast majority of tiles, in fact, are coming out of Persia and Isfahan with the um, Robert Murdoch Smith and, and, and so forth. So just to sort of answer your question in the sense of I wanted to think about what particular challenges are set up here in this Arab hall because it's making itself not into a museum but it, or, or into a restored historic house but into a work of art. And, and that's precisely, precisely what interests me about De Morgan's role here, because they're the object, these, it's the project of doing that in this space that sets up the biggest of the, of the challenges um, for him with the tiles that the other, you know, I would also be really interested if we looked at the Matrabia and to see, I don't know if part of the restoration um, Daniel, there was much conversation about the kind of work being done to sort of create the Mashrabia out of its bits and pieces. Has there been any kind of analysis of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Which, yeah. Years ago, was it a collection of more than tiles in which the main two sets of tiles of faces would come in? That uh, which always tends not to be presented to more than, but there was a set of them, I mean, as you say, it's identical to the thing, but it would with more than stamp on the back. Mm. So, Interesting. You know, so I think yeah. Interesting. And it's fair to say that he gets better at replicating that Isnik tile pair later on in his career. You can see that some of those are terrible, but some of them are actually very but precise. I, think but that, yeah. I, did, I have wondered hmm. whether the, how poor those repairs are. Was it deliberate thing? Well, that was a signal repair? That was you know, my point. Not to try and lose yeah. the repair. Yeah. Right, right, to distinguish between the repair and the original. I don't get that sense. I don't get that. I, I mean, I don't get that sense. We, would, you would push back and, and suggest that that may have been deliberate. I, I just. It's interesting what you mm. said about the um, the grouting having changed colour. Yeah. So you know, perhaps it was far less evident when it was finished than it is now. Yeah. So that is another interesting. Question. Another prospect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One more question. So um, yeah, in that busy road there, if you go to your left. 
Thank you, Mary. That was just uh, very provocative and fascinating, and I, I'm not sure that I quite um, get it, but um, the aesthetic of the ruin, and I wonder how you uh, hmm. would correlate with, with that nostalgia that um, keeps, keeps coming along from since the 18th century at least, and um, that longing, and whether what you're discussing here, this resistant materiality is a kind of politicisation of the nostalgia of the aesthetic of the ruin. Yes, it, it's, that's uh, an interesting set of possibility theories, and it's one certainly I've entertained with the idea when one looks at those scars. And I don't discount that some viewers would have seen the kind of historic value underlined by the fact that these, the breaks are actually evidence of the, aging, uh, the age of the tiles. But I do think for De Morgan, when the project is one of revivifying British craft and, and learning from them in the ways in which he writes about that project of figuring out the lustreware glaze technique, that this is an experimental craft worker who's actually trying to equal them and perhaps surpass them. Thank you very much. Thank you.